live here, and we are extremely proud of that. A man who started his journalism career as a beat reporter in his hometown, Chicago, in the 50s. He has been writing about American and international politics, diplomacy, security, military issues for, um, well, he wrote nine books. He worked for the New York Times, for UPI, for AP, and uh, we'll talk about the small newspaper where he started. Um, he's been called by some in the Bush administration the closest thing American journalism has to a terrorist. <laughs> And he has also said that there's a huge difference between, between writing and thinking, and he has a reputation for allowing himself more leeway in speeches than in writing. So we will make the most of this. There are microphones on each side of the audience. I will start off with a question, but interrupt me. Please come with your questions, because he's here and he's going to talk to us. Mr. Seymour Hirsch. show host. Since we are in Belgium, um, you have a Belgian sports connection. Oh, just, I oh, come on, just about tennis. Okay, just about tennis. Well, sports is one of the most important things in life. I'm a fanatic about staying in shape because I'm old. Yeah, I'm a pretty good tennis player. I, I used to play tennis with somebody who used to be a hitting partner of, uh, of Justine Hennen. Justine Hennen. And um, what did you learn from this hitting partner? Anything she learned from him as well? I learned that she would spend an hour hitting balls to the same spot. An hour? Wow. wow. Hitting balls to the same spot. And he made you better? A better tennis player? No, he just he just had fun driving me crazy. That's all. <laughs> he was, she had a few like that. And he was actually paid. He was going to law school. He was from Czechoslovakia going to law school here in Brussels. All right. And, um, and so he was actually paid to do it. And he also liked her very much. Good. Well, so I'm happy to be. I'm glad to hear she's happy. She's now happy. Now she quit tennis. Oh boy. <laughs> um, you also have other European connections, right? In your um, ancestry. Oh, just I'm I'm a I'm a you know a mongrel as most Americans are. My mother was from Poland. My father came from Lithuania. And um, sometimes I wonder about. I think if Romney had won, would I have tried to get a. Uh, a passport from Lithuania, I doubt it. <laughs> I thought about it. We, you know, everybody's making jokes about we're all going to go to Canada. Uh -huh. Romney wins. Uh, but he didn't. Are you happy Obama won? Uh, I, I was totally for Obama because the alternative was so bad. But Obama certainly, um, uh, uh, I don't think he's going to be uh, Abraham Lincoln. I don't think he's going to. I think he's got great limitations. And I think if any of you ever read or watched the third, the great foreign policy debate he had, he was channeling uh, Bush-Cheney foreign policy. I see very, you know, war on terror. Uh, there's, uh, we still have secret prisons, we still do renditions, we still, we now use drones to kill people. Um, and so I, just, I see no significant change in American foreign policy yet. He's going to stay away from the Middle East, he's going to South Asia uh, uh, to stick it to the Chinese a little bit. Um, and it's all sort of silly because the issues are in the Middle East right now, as we know what's going to happen. Um, um, uh, there's nothing as dangerous as, as an Israeli politician like Bibi with an election coming up. You know, if he can't bomb Iran, he's going to do something against Gaza. Mm. Who knows what's going to happen there? It's not good. So what do you think, uh, what does it say about Europe that we in Europe love Obama? Uh, it's. You know, it's um, uh, part of it is the alternative, and part of it is that there are, there are the idea that an African American man became president is very attractive. Um, Europe is much more progressive, I think, on, on issues of race, even though, um, as we know, in, in, in there's a lot of anti-Muslim, uh, anti-anti-immigration stuff going on here, uh, particularly in the, in, the, in the Baltic states, uh, which isn't good, but the, that exists everywhere. Um, uh, you know, I was talking to Edith yesterday. Europe hasn't made its case. He was making the case that you guys really don't make a good case for yourself as a powerful sort of entity, mm -hmm. a collective entity. That will be overtaken by China in any aspect pretty soon, oh, right? I'm one of those people that say, come on Brazil, come on India, let's go get America out of it. We don't want to be the leading powers anymore. First of all, we're bankrupt. Secondly, we're morally bankrupt in terms of the wars we conduct. And anybody that thinks you can solve anything by by bombing, drone bomb drones, and we all know from there were great studies done after the Second World War, 
the bombing in particular, whether you're doing it from a drone, or whether, you know, a Kyla, let's bomb, or whether you're doing it from SB-52 bombings, as in Vietnam, bombing does never works. It doesn't do anything but increases alienation. And so, what drives me crazy as an American, as a journalist, and by the way, let me tell you what, what there is about, it's really simple about what journalism is all about. There's no way the political leaders of the world are going to do it right. And we have, that's, what, that's the, our role, that's what I see. It's not only speaking truth to power, it's just the idea, we've, we've been failed so often by leadership. In America, we, have, we go from one stupid, insane, um, unproductive war about which the leadership knows nothing from Vietnam, we, we cartwheel into Grenada, <laughs> and then we go into, uh, you know, I used to joke that uh, before Bill Clinton, I didn't joke, I used to say it, but uh, I ended up... Uh, <laughs> he never listened. <laughs> well, I used to say that Bill Clinton, in 1998 and 1999, he actually began to do stuff in, the, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Yugoslavia, and, and that, you know, in Belgrade, and that particular horrible mess that existed there. And when the American planes bombed, I think it was 99 or 98, when we began the bomb, which also wasn't as successful as you want to, they'll, they'll tell you, it was the first time in America since the end of World War II that we actually bombed white people. We found it very easy to go to war in Asia, and, as I say, Grenada, and, and it, you know, it's just, but you know, um, I, I tend not to say that anymore because people get too angry. You don't want to. You know, <laughs> well, you said it here in a room full of journalists. No, but you know, any American the ones that are here are more, more or less progressives are all lefties. Right. <laughs> you you see, you were saying um, the no way that the political leaders are uh, are going to do it right. You seem to be of the impression that one journalist can change the world. No, one journalist can't change the world, but the notion that we're there does put a limit. And uh, in America right now, um, we have such, uh, you know, I don't know what, how you want to describe the American Congress, whether we're, you know, are they lying prone or supine, but they're lying down. And this woman coming in from this Elizabeth Warren, this the one the woman coming in from Massachusetts, and some of the other women being elected, for the first time we're gonna have some some it's not necessarily gender, but we're gonna have some people, they have to be women that are really bright. And that may make a difference. One woman may change well, the world. Well, one woman presents an outpost of which other people can sort of tuck in. And so journalism, the mere fact that we're there, I think, just the fact that we're there, you know, whether you're I said to you earlier, I was watching with great interest the, uh, um, the marathon runner. Um, I, I could no more do that, um, but my children can, can follow that. And I, was, I just thought when, they, when the, he was finally called and he, of course, disavowed any sense of any guilt or responsibility, it struck me, and I, I mentioned this just a minute ago, that I've been doing, let's see, I, I, I dealt with, in Chicago I dealt with criminals, murderers, I was a police reporter. It's a criminal, I've seen cops kill people, and I've certainly mass murderers and political murderers and political criminals. I've seen you know, bad stuff. And in 50 years of being a reporter, I've never met anybody who thought he did anything wrong. <laughs> not one. So that's, uh, that's where we are. We're the persons that says, hey, you know, it's not just truth to power, it's more than that. It's just that the, the instinct people who want to do journalism have is an instinct that goes beyond I'm dealing. I'm doing a book now, and I'm dealing with people. I'm dealing with a book about Cheney that spill over into Obama because the policy is the same. I'm dealing with people on the inside, general officers and admirals. There's, there are people in every society whose loyalty, in the case of America, is to the Constitution and not to the president and not to their immediate boss. And so there are people, and you will find people that whose loyalty is to the civil order. And decency, and so that's what we, our job is. To make Those them. people we need to find, and they, and they have to find you too. Right, and they have to know you exist. So that's what it's about. We'll talk about finding sources in a bit. Um, let's take us back a little bit. Well, let's say to 1969. That was your breakthrough with the story on the massacre committed by American soldiers in the Vietnam village of My Lai. Um, but tell us how you landed in journalism, because that was a little bit before that, right? No, I, I flunked out of law school. That's all. I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, it's the same story. Serendipity. I applied for a job. And yet it's a, you know, it's the same story. I, I, you know, I didn't know I wanted to. I, could, I knew I could write, but I went to the University of Chicago, which was a very progressive place. When I got to Chicago, the first thing I was asked at the University of Chicago, and I was just a kid, I, as I, I, I went to public school, and, um, and uh, I was smart, but I, I wasn't... 
my family didn't read. I, I, I joined the Book of the Month Club when I was 13. I used to get for 99 cents a month, I got most of these anti-communist books. That was there before uh, Oprah started doing book club, right? <laughs> but I went to Chicago, I remember the first thing I was asked whether I was a, a follower of Soc Socrate Socrate Socratic or, or a, a Platonist or a Maoist, and I thought they meant Meowist. I was like, what the hell do cats have to do with this? I'm serious. No, you know, you start from nothing. And you start, we all start from the same place, and we, we learn. And in my case, um, I don't know why I... Um, I had, I was a police reporter in Chicago, something called the City News Bureau, Ben Heck, and if you know, there's a, a play called Front Page, a very famous play. It's a, it was a, an agency set up by the Chicago newspapers and the radio stations eventually to cover the courts and crime because there was so much of it. It was just a place you were thrown in. You had to have a, either one, half the people graduated from a journalism school at Northwest and the other half, to, all you needed was a BA. And I just applied, and months later I got this job and I ended up on the street, and one of the first things that happened is I was covering the south side, Hyde Park, uh, where, 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 it happened, where I live, uh, at the police, and oh, within a few weeks of being on the street, after being a copy boy, um, some guy in the black ghetto of Chicago went nuts and he burned, um, <coughs> set, he killed his wife and children and set the house on fire, and I went to this house, you know, I was one of the first, we, we listened to the police and radio radio, police and fire department radios, and I dashed there, and there is this scene where the, the fire department had laid out the bodies, sort of like Mama Bear, Papa Bear, <laughs> covered them up, and they laid them up by size. There were five children, and the mother and father. And I, I was just blown away, so much death. And I called it in, and I remember this one of those great moments. I, you know, and I called it into the editor of the city newsroom. There was a guy named Casey Bucker, who later became the environmental editor for Chicago Tribune. And I was dictating, the way it worked was I would dictate, and they would put the story on a wire real quickly. Uh, just a telegraph wire, this is back in 60, actually, maybe 61. And the, a senior editor, who's now dead, but he interrupted, he came on the phone and he said, Ah, my good, dear, energetic Mr. Hirsch. And he said, Yes, sir. And he said, Are they, alas, of the American Negro persuasion? And I said, Yes. He said, Cheap it out. That meant seven people were killed in a fire yesterday. So I learned a lot from that. Mm -hmm. I learned later, one night, I was working in City Hall, down, downtown Maine, Chicago Police. And being a, a city, a, a, in a big city, a police reporter is great. I, a, we, I worked a night shift, and I would, I would smoke the dope with the cops. They arrested and watched the dirty movies. <laughs> it, it, it was much, much more primitive than it is now. Um, and I'm amazed nobody's asking me about Petraeus, but you will. <laughs> <laughs> and, or they will. <laughs> they will. Um, and I remember um, uh, uh, two cops were killed, federal police. They were um, uh, um, uh, immigration police. They were killed. They were found. There was a shoot up right nearby. And I remember running to the scene. And again, the whole business of what I did was scoops. And the scoop at the City News Bureau was 10 minutes, just like they are in American network television. You're a hero if you can say who's going to be the vice president three minutes early. That's a big story. And that's the level of sophistication it is, really. Talk about not investigative reporting and not going deep. And I remember getting to the scene, and there were these two guys. The car was, had crashed into a pole, and there were bullet holes and blood all over. And I looked at I was there just as the police were coming, because I got the first report. It was only a few miles away drove there very quickly, and I, uh, there was a, the cops were there, and they were obviously angry, and I went to the, the, the police captain on the scene, this is a fellow cop, and I said, are they dead? And he grabbed me, and he threw me as hard as he could against the car, and they called me, you know, the worst vulgar word, um, not so shocking anymore, but Chris Rock uses it, but anyway, <laughs> and, uh, and he said, uh, not until I pronounce you, dumb son of a bitch pronounced by the coroner. Mm -hmm. The dilemma was, do I, this goes back to what happened in London, the dilemma was, do I wait for the coroner or do I report what I'm pretty sure that they're dead? Mm -hmm. you I in. learned that lesson so early. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with waiting. Nothing, Nothing wrong, wrong with, with waiting. Speed is our worst enemy. Speed. And competition is our worst enemy. And most of it's fantastical anyway, because some of the stuff I do, but I still worry about being, so we all worry about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you asked me about Me Lai when I first wrote that first story about Me Lai, and um, nobody would buy it. Uh, I'd been 
by 1960, and I, I covered the war in Vietnam, and I learned uh, for the Associated Press. I worked, started working, I worked in suburban newspapers as a kid, I went to City News, I was in the Army, um, and uh, 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 just talking about generals in the Army, the Army's so alienated, you're, mm -hmm. you're without women, I mean, you know, it, it, if it hadn't been for masturbation, everybody would go crazy. You know? And so, of course, there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on, even with generals. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. And, but I got out of the Army, and I ended up working. I owned a newspaper. After a little while, I did a suburban... You interview. owned a newspaper? Well, I started a paper with a friend in a suburban newspaper. And we were just smart. I had a wonderful friend who was a photographer. And the first edition of the paper was in a small rural community, a suburban community in Chicago. And and uh, the first edition in the center, the, the, what they call the double truck center, uh, my friend came, it was, happened to be the first day, our first edition came when the, right at the time that they were starting a new school year, and uh, the kindergarten kids were being um, uh, their first day, and he went and took pictures with somebody there getting every name. Mm -hmm. Took a, 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 a hundred pictures of kids coming, and we ran maybe 40 photographs in the first edition of, of children that frightened look and that scary look, some happy, some sad, and we were just off and running. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it is, right. all getting to the base. And uh, after a little while, we were so successful, I got scared. I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. Making money, you know, I just didn't want to do it. So I left and went to work for UPI, then I worked for AP, got to Viet, got the cover of the Pentagon, went overseas. Covered the war. Mostly, I was did a lot, a lot in the military, covering the Pentagon. The war was insane. <coughs> it was just an insane war. And what's objectivity? Objectivity then was pretending that um, we don't have an opinion about the war, and that's just crazy. Mm -hmm. So I, I left that. I, I got in trouble because I was writing critical things about the war, and I went to work. I did freelance, and then I went to work for somebody running for president against Linda Johnson, Eugene McCarthy. And because he was committed to the war, he was a, he was a Benedictine and um, a very devout. And he used to, he did something that was... He wanted to stop the war? Well, not only that, he talked about the war as being immoral. Mm -hmm. And that was a word you don't hear in politics anymore. I, mean, I was, he was a difficult man, but I was in love with him in the sense because he was willing to say this is immoral. Mm -hmm. What we did in Iraq is immoral. You can argue about getting rid of Saddam or not. The way we left the country was immoral. We've left the country in rooms. That's not moral. We didn't do right. And it, we're not done with Iraq. We're going to be held yeah. okay there, too. Do you think that the war in Iraq would have stopped sooner if somebody had done a story on it like you did in for all the Vietnam War? Because it said it hastened the end of the war, this story. I, I don't think Eli hastened anything. The war ended because we got beat. And I think what happened there, and I don't also don't think that there was nothing, the surge is a fantastic, or another fantasy. All that happened is we began to pay some of the Sunni tribes people that we've been afraid to deal with because they were Baptists, and I'm sure most of you know can follow what I'm saying. We were anti-Baptists, um, even though the Baptists were... The Saddam party. The Saddam, yeah. but they were extremely hostile to uh, jihadists, just as Bashar Assad has been, and mm -hmm. his father and he both carried on a tradition of uh, doing incredible intelligent work against the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which we kept, we used after 9-11, we went to that. But anyway, the point is that about uh, Vietnam, all that happened is we began to pay some of the people we thought were our enemies to kill the more extreme, uh, if you want to call them Al-Qaeda, I don't, I think Al-Qaeda is a myth now, but American politicians use it to scare us. You know, Al-Qaeda Al in North Africa, I mean, they're jihadist fanatics, and it's been jihadist fanatics for, so what you're saying, in a way, is not your journalism ended the war, but money. Money ends wars if you start paying people. Well, they paid in the beginning to kill the people we couldn't kill. And so that's called the surge. And that became sort of an American myth that somehow it had been a successful thing. All we did was finally get smart. <coughs> in the book I'm doing, I write a great length about the incredible stupidity of American generals because some of the pathists started coming to us right after the war and said, you're, you're getting rid of the wrong people. You're, you're putting, you're empowering the wrong people. And they couldn't talk to the generals because the orders were, you know, we were against the Baptists, and no general could figure it out. And so they, there's something, you know, um, there is a reason that generals are generals, and, and they, they have to be sub, sub, subservient to, uh, to uh, political power. And if you want to know, um, 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 there's, there's uh, the Tocqueville wrote about it. 
the talk a lot about the gay contradiction of America. In, you know, we're talking about a, a, almost what, 1830s, 1840s. The great contradiction of America is the masses of the people are against war. But because it's such a democratic society, unlike in Europe, in, 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 traditionally in Europe, the upper classes become military leaders, particularly England's a classic example. You know, the Lord becomes the leader of a, of a troop, of a, of a royal Scotsman. And in America, because it's a democratic society, and the working anybody from the hoi polloi becomes a general, the generals, therefore, are very pro-war, because the more war they have, the faster the advancement. So you have this great contradiction of a democracy. He wrote about it about in 1835, and it turned out to be very true. Now, you're talking to these, these people in the Army for your new book. Um, let's talk a little bit about how to find these people, how to find these sources, and then we'll throw it open to questions. How do you find your sources? What can we learn from the way you work? Well, um, I just look at myself as a good service agency. And by that I mean, if, if um, um, by the time I got through Milai and by the time I got to the New York Times, it was clear that if you had something that was very troublesome to you and you, you wanted to talk to me and you didn't want to be public, you know, I, everybody defines a whistleblower as somebody who goes public. I think there are whistleblowers that can be inside the bureaucracy that want to talk to you that you want to have to protect. That's just as important. Uh, 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 what you do is you, you, you're, you, you don't, somebody comes to you with a story and you say, what I see in newspapers all the time are tips that aren't worked, that aren't developed. You take the information and you add on to it. Take your time, which is all, most people's, most newspapers don't have the money now. We heard that earlier today. One of the problems with investigative reporting is there's no money, no time. But you, you know, uh, I was always able to do it, maybe I was just lucky, but also as a freelancer. And you make the story so much better that when you write the story, whatever information you got initially, you've gone beyond. So the person who initially gave you the information feels comfortable because you've written about stuff he doesn't know and he doesn't have access to. And I have to tell you, in America, in the Bush-Cheney years, um, um, I was getting much more information than I could write because I had to protect people. And once I, I, I mentioned something in a document, um, 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 two years after I got the document, two years after I got a document from somebody, and documents aren't always important, sometimes they are, they're also dangerous because they can be traced. I mentioned, I wrote one sentence from one document and the person who gave it to me had moved on, he was an army colonel. And he was then getting a, a doctorate at, um, for the army, and he was called by three people uh, who because were they could trace. They he was the source. And he lied. He said he I had a lie, which he didn't want to do. And he was so mad at me he couldn't see straight because he gave it to me on the condition that I wouldn't use it for a long time. And he thought two years was long enough, and he was right. That's that's ages in journalism, isn't it? Yeah. Two years, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. all part of it. Anyway, it's yeah. all crazy. So you often go to people who are not right at the top, but who are a little bit below. I read no, somewhere. It's, it's you go to. It's not hard. You go to somebody who spent his career in the army, let's say, and he retired as a two-star general, and the highest rank is four-star. Well, everybody who retires as a two-star has a story about why he isn't a three-star or a four-star. <laughs> you start from that premise. You find people that retire from the intelligence service. And if they retire early, or they retire in the middle of, a, of an important career, you know something happened. Most of the time they won't talk to you, but they will sometimes. Do you think Petraeus will talk to you? No. No. Uh, no. <laughs> Petraeus is a myth in the sense that um, he was always somebody who did his best work with the American press corps. And um, um, my take on him, I remember being asked to go, everybody had his, uh, a lot of reporters had his uh, email, his private email. And uh, he would always ask people to run with him, and they were always flattered. And you know, in America, as it, anywhere in the world, it's uh, particularly for the major, when I worked at the New York Times, I wasn't, I didn't have a beat. But, but if I had a beat, I would be dependent on the people in charge. If I covered the White House, I'd have to be nice to the White House. I couldn't be an outsider. So there's an inherent conflict. You need access. Yeah. If you're covering City Hall, you need access to the mayor. And if you're out there giving them grief, you're not going to get it. So that's a complication. And I don't think, and editors, even at the New York Times, they, um, even at the New Yorker, I mean, they often don't, you know, I'll get a message. Uh, let's say Petraeus blows up, I'll, I'll get an email, hey, what, uh, WTF? You know, I'll get that message. What, what do you know? Yeah. As if somehow I'm magic, I could just reach in and find out. I, I will tell you this about Petraeus, which is that he's not popular, he's not liked, 
and everybody in America, I'm just, I'm speaking heuristically, I don't have, um, well, <laughs> you're, everybody's looking at the story the wrong way. Okay. Don't look in terms of the woman. Look in terms of the people inside the CIA who wanted to get rid of him. That's where, That's where you is. start. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There was a man named John Deutsch who was made the foothead of the CIA, an MIT professor, that the CIA got rid of within a, within a year. They, they suddenly discovered he was taking top secret documents home. I mean, which everybody does. And that lost him his job. Everybody does that. And you have to, you can't work. You, so look at it. Um, I said to somebody earlier at breakfast this morning, here's a man who had a personal computer, which he's not allowed to do, but he's, he's head of the CIA, he can do anything. He had a computer. I guarantee he, he probably had it encrypted, but that, you know, you're dealing with... CIA can yeah, deal with that. Anybody, so does the FBI. Know, yeah, but that's, and he would know that. He would know, it's, he's probably better off not even encrypting. Why bother? And he did personal business. But the only thing, and I do know this, what I do know is I do know, he never took it home. And everybody takes their personal computer home. In the CIA, if you want to have emails with your wife, actually the way they work at the CIA is a lot of the people have, uh, uh, what do they call the, uh, um, the thing, the, the towers. Everybody, most of them have three or four towers. Mm -hmm. And they have one tower for national security and intercepts, one tower for this. And there's another tower, if you're writing a paper, uh, whether you're in high school or at the CIA, you want to use Google to check stuff. You, you, so if you go, there's a tower that enables you to go on Google and do email with your wife and the kids, they can reach you. But of course, anybody checking the IP address, it'll come out as to a defense contractor. Right. Or McDonnell Douglas, Raytheon. It comes out not as from the CIA, and that's why you have to use, any home computer has to be funneled to there. He could do what he wanted. But here's a guy that never took it home. When he went away for two weeks, he didn't take his computer home. So, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say, what the hell's on that computer he doesn't want his wife to see? So if you start with that premise. Isn't that the way investigative journalism works? Just looking at it from a totally different side, being exactly an outsider. Out. You go, you just say, this didn't come because some woman complained to the FBI. Because, let me tell you. The Federal Bureau of Investigation would spend all any time you know um, uh, two people bitch at each other on email. It's not a federal that doesn't rise to the level of an FBI investigation. No. So the whole premise of the story is completely insane. Right, right. There's and, just and no way it started. It, way. it started because this woman in Kelly. There's no way she called up somebody in the FBI and he began an investigation. Are you kidding? They would say uh, call the local cops and mm -hmm. the local cops would say who cares what she who says cares? to you in writing. Yeah. So she's mad at you. Go, go do a There's campaign. no premise for any investigation. So it didn't start there. No. Well, let's open it up to questions. If you have questions, just stand up, raise your hand. There are yeah, two people see. with microphones. We have time for questions. So um, if they're still a little, you know, embarrassed and overwhelmed, I have, I have another question for you. Why don't people have questions? You should have a question. Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's questions. And there's a microphone, and then we will take it to the lady back there. No, be Yes, there's all those talk was before about data journalism. Are you impressed by this data journalism? Um, I don't do it because I'm 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 a luddite. Um, um, my children do it. My I have a son that's a journalist. He knows how to do it. I, Where does he work? Uh, he now at the, he was uh, he did he did. I was telling one of your students. He went off. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East and he came with me and he got interested. He went and learned Arabic and learned enough Arabic and lived in Beirut as a freelancer for a couple of years and now does stuff for Huffington, which is interesting because Huffington's very primitive, you know, but they have a lot of reporters and it's it's got some money and they in five years, because they have they don't have a plant, they don't print anything. They're going to end up making a lot, an awful lot of money, and maybe right. we'll get. You know, they need to do a lot of work. They need much better editing. Right. They need better organization internally, like everybody does. But because they're going to end up being someplace anyway. I've seen it work. I have friends, for example, who work. Um, I have a couple of friends who do a lot of great reporting on bad drugs, and they use the. the, the we have a tremendous in the United States. I'm sure all countries do very good morbidity, morbidity and mortality studies that the federal government keeps. And also the Center for Disease Control will report on all deaths. So you can really, I've, uh, 10 years ago, um, one of my friends was running huge, crunchy numbers. So there's a tremendous way it fits in. I'm not sure, 
Um, and sometimes in foreign policy, I'm not sure. You could certainly track smuggling. You can track in organized crime. It's very important because you, you can track can, offshore if, money. Offshore. I mean, I, I was saying to somebody, I'm amazed everybody here is in stone with all the heroin they smuggle in here. <laughs> you know, in this place, I, I should imagine it'd be dust, heroin dust mm -hmm. all over. Uh, so there's a lot of smuggling, a lot of corruption. Oil is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, um, oil is always when Russia fell. There was a lot of very good studies I read about um, you know, the, the fall of Russia is one of the great stories of all time because every, everybody, you know, um, most of the, uh, uh, Nazabaya, for example, and uh, uh, most of these people were KGB, they just grabbed all the assets. The Russia's an amazing story. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, um, my own guess is Putin's going to be involved in protecting Bashar Assad. He's going to win the Nobel Peace Prize in two years. <laughs> so we, we, don't, we don't have Syria explode. We'll quote you on that. We'll, we'll, keep, we'll hold you to it. Um, so you see the potential for data journalism. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I mean, you know, I'm old, so it's not my stuff. But, but I, you know, I actually, I have people that do stuff for me. Okay. I do have people that run stuff for me, yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hirsch, thank you very much for the candid way you talked about your career as a journalist. And at the same time... Me for not lying? Is that what you said? You're there for not touching. lying? Yeah, but I don't know. What low standards you have? Go ahead. Anyway, anyway, you touched on so many important uh, journalistic issues, and one of them is uh, objectivity. You said um, it's ridiculous that journalists shouldn't say that the war is immoral. I would like to hear from you uh, maybe some examples of journalists who did uh, uh, say something about their moral view on the war and did uh, good journalistic stories. Well, one of the problems with the United States, it's better now, but back at, when the Vietnam War was going in the 1960s, um, uh, when I first joined the New York Times, for example, objectivity was uh, somebody who didn't say the truth about what he thought about the war or what he believed to be true. So we really had an incredible problem. It's been much improved because we uh, right now uh, you can... Uh, this is one of the real problems you have because there's a tremendous diversion between young people and the older editors and I always found uh, I was lucky because I worked for an extreme right winger named Abe Rosenthal who was almost in his age he was really wacky but he used to go he hired me and he used to go into the newsroom in Washington I'm exaggerating slightly he'd go like this how's my little commie today what do you have for me what do you have for me today so it's really interesting I think Obama screwed up everything in the American press because uh, there, there was basically such a, a love affair with Obama in, in the press corps too that it's very hard to get right objectively to the stories that, uh, that went down easy. You could do anything you wanted when Bush and Cheney were in power uh, are harder now. So I don't know. Objectivity is uh, it's just the most overrated issue in the world. It's just calling things the way they are. And so... Um, uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago, you were fired. Uh, I was taken off of the Pentagon beat by the Pentagon when I covered the AP for the Associated Press because they, I was writing about bombing. And what they started to do is I was, at the, when I covered the Pentagon, which obviously they thought was a big mistake, you know, uh, uh, putting me there um, because I began to be more and more critical of the war and they began, they would sometimes hold stories but as the Pentagon correspondent for the Associated Press in those primitive days, I could get on the phone, call up the, the wire room, and say, bulletin. And I would get the wire, because um, th these are the days when I would file bulletins. And everything was oral. It's amazing. One of the things about working for a wire service in a war is I could write a thousand words in two minutes off the top of my head by just on a phone. You just learn to be so verbal. and. Um, um, and I would sometimes file seven, eight hundred words before the, uh, the uh, press office for Robert McNamara, who was a great, one of the great psychotic lawyers, liars of our time. You know, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. McNamara lied. Uh, he's a liar. He lied about the war. He wrote later that he was lying to himself, but he's responsible. I just, he was responsible for so much death. He refused to hear that the war wasn't going well. He refused to hear it, and so, you know, and, and yet still honored, I mean, look at Henry, I wrote a book about Henry Kissinger, that, um, uh, and uh, um, 
my attitude towards Kissinger, what's wrong with saying it? Is the rest of us sleep? We can't sleep, we count sheep. Mm -hmm. He has to spend the rest of his life counting burned and maimed Cambodian babies if he can't sleep. And that's just the way it is. And there's nothing wrong with saying it. And we think it. Why not say it? But it's, it was, it's better now. If we can prove it, we can say it. And we can. You can, you know, you asked me about writing and thinking. You can, you can write and think a lot differently than what you can. You can think much and, and, and you know, um, you, you, can, you, you, can, you, you can dream in revolutions, you know, and, and, and changing of society. Writing is different. It is different. You have to be, um, but I, I, I don't think I don't think what I said about um, Kissinger, for example, about uh, that there's a lot of blood in his hands is irrational. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been you know it just it's nothing wrong with saying it. We have a question there. Uh, just a short double question: uh, How do you protect yourself and your sources, and how do you pick your stories? Well, it's not hard to pick your stories now. I mean, we've got, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing Cheney right now. I've been doing Cheney for years, and what happened is there were people who went to work for Cheney, who, Cheney had been Secretary of Defense earlier, in 1989, and 1980, from, for four years until 1993, for the, George, the first president, George Bush, who, by the way, was one mean, tough guy. And um, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on him, too. I mean, he's, he's as tough as Cheney was. It, we just didn't see it. Um, uh, 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 Iran-Contra Iran was the least of it, <laughs> what went on in the 80s. But, but having said that, um, so people went to work, saw Cheney officers in the Pentagon, worked for Cheney, did things for Cheney when he was Secretary of Defense, and he was very calm and rational. If you remember, he was the one in the first war against Iraq, the first famous war in 1991, after Iraq went into Kuwait, he's the one that said, we're not going to go to Baghdad, we're not going to overthrow them. Um, in the highway of death, some most of you are too young to know, we were slaughtering people. Mm -hmm. We were slaughtering the army, retreating. They stopped it. It was just mass murder. American planes were just murdering. He stopped it. So people, when he became vice president, some of the people who maybe were colonels or one-star officers or senior officers, they went to work for him. And after 9-11, he became, you know, Islamofascist. He became somebody very hostile, and that frightened people. So people began to, some people who knew me began to start talking to me in late 101 and 0203. And there were people that, there were people that I, one person I had 180 interviews with while he worked for Cheney, and I used it one tenth of one one hundredth of one percent because I had to protect them. It was very painful. How do you do that then? How do you protect them? Um, I never quoted. He went to every meeting with Cheney. Mm -hmm. I never quoted anything that Cheney said in the meeting, except there were two or three times when other people would come into a meeting, some visiting group of mm -hmm. foreign allies, and if he said something then, then I would use the quote, so Cheney's people would think one of those people had done right. it. We did it on okay. purpose. Okay. But Cheney was a, um, and so you, you just protect them. It's terrible sometimes, because sometimes you, you can't, um, um, I do know more about Petraeus, but it comes from somebody who was obviously involved in, um, I, I think the story is he was brought down from inside. Mm -hmm. I, I can't prove that yet, but I, that's my thought. He was brought down from inside, and everything else has followed from that. He was, he was, he was taken down because of what he was doing inside, making changes. And that is, you know, that is his way. He's a very aggressive sort of, and the CIA is a... That's what he did in the army, but the CIA doesn't work that way, right? The CIA is a, they're killers there. They're really tough. We have a question here, and then we have a question in the back. So Yes, yes. go ahead. Just um, holler. Just holler. Just go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Stand up and holler. Yeah. Tom, and then uh, again. Yeah, we... Tom, uh, first again. Ladies first. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you ever had... Louder. <laughs> I can paraphrase, otherwise. I was wondering if you have ever had a moment I'm not going to protect this person because this news is so important. I have to publish about it. It's a very no. psychologic... No. Why not? <laughs> because... If it can save more people's lives, then this person can be good. Sacrificing one for saving many. Yes, exactly. Um, probably because, you know, I want to keep them for myself for selfish reasons and all, you know, people ask me, when you did Me Lie, 
uh, wasn't it wonderful you knew we were going to help end the war? And I say, are you kidding? I did me life, fame, fortune, glory. You know, I mean, we all work, we all work for different reasons. Probably I would, I haven't had that, it hasn't been that clean as you describe it. I mean, that's, that's in the movies. Nothing is that, but if it was that direct, I'd probably go for hanging and not exposing somebody. It, I, I thought you were going to ask me this question. I'll give you a harder example. Suppose you're dealing with somebody and he lies to you, and you've dealt with him before, and he's been pretty good, and somebody lies to you. In the CIA, for example, you deal with overt, covert operators because lying is what they do for life. They live a lie, they are liars, they're manipulators, they're users. It's an incredibly deadly organization. It's so contradictory to everything democracy stands for. Why we put up with the CIA, I don't know, but we do. I'll tell you why, because presidents get into office and they can't do anything. Congress, they can't, Congress says no. Here they are, President of the United States, but they can take a walk in the Rose Garden mm -hmm. with the head of the CIA and somebody can get hurt somewhere. Mm -hmm. They love that. <laughs> that's what, I, that, I think that's why we don't stop it. But the, the issue, the better question would be, what do you do if somebody lies to you? What do you but, do? But you don't, you want to expose them, but you don't because in the long run, um, uh, you expose the lie but not the person? No, I don't even know if you do that. In the long run, you say to yourself, the only way I stay in business is I don't expose people. I also, if somebody gives me a document, I don't pass it on to another friend, even another journalist, which everybody, it, journalism is a very collegial business. And I almost never, I will help people, I'll help them get jobs, but I won't share paper with anybody. So, do you believe in cooperation between media or between journalists? I, I, I have a lot of problem Group projects would bother me a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, Even if a project is too large to just do by uh, one medium or one journalist? Well, you know, in fourth grade, there's a box teachers have does not get along with others. You know, that's, <laughs> so I don't, I don't do group journalism. But, that's, but I understand the, the value of group journalism. I do understand it. And, it. and you have to work in groups. But your question's a tough one. I've never had it. I, I'd like to think that if I ever had a situation where I knew something. But you know, there was a great case in America, the Pentagon Papers case. And we all still know about that, right? The Pentagon Papers, where the New York Times got all these papers and the government tried to stop it. And they went to the Supreme Court. And the, the lawyer for the New York Times, a, a, a Yale professor, a very eminent lawyer, one of the justices in the argument said, um, um, uh, the government says these are national security papers. And, and, and the lawyer for the New York Times said, well, it doesn't meet that threshold. And the, the justice said, suppose it's 1918, 1917 in America, and an American ship full of, we call them doughboys, soldiers were going over to fight the war in, in Europe. If you remember, we were slow getting into World War I, and, as we were getting into World War II. But um, uh, there was a lot of, uh, and so, um, and if, 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 um, you knew that when the ship was sailing and you're a reporter, and this is interesting news, you wanted to write it, but you also knew that the Germans had, they had you, they had the very primitive submarines, U-boats. I don't know what they called them back in the World War I, but they had submarines outside the harbor of New York. They did, that literally was true. They were, they were Axis or Nazi submarines, they weren't Nazis, they were German. <laughs> submarines, Nazis weren't there yet. Um, and uh, uh, is, that a, is that a time of national security when the government had a right to stop you? And the reporter said yes. And I would say, are you kidding? If I'm a journalist and I know when the ship's gonna, gonna, public, gonna, going, gonna ship, I would write it so they would change the date, because certainly other people would. So there's always a lot of arguments, real or otherwise. You know, there's always a way to combat the notion of national security. And the case you posed to me, which has never happened, that I know something that can save lives, um, there's, at the New York Times, there were a couple of times, the New York Times, I had a lot of stories in which the White House or the president would call up before, and they would say to the editors, if you publish the story, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the Russians are going to start parachuting into San Francisco, you know, and, and in every case except one, uh, we published, and they didn't parachute. 
So this is, you know, this is a complicated issue, but you know, it hasn't happened the way you frame it. It just that doesn't happen in the real world. It's not that simple. I have time for one more question. I hate to do this to you, but he's going to be around at least also all through tonight at the dinner. So you can talk to him anytime. Grab him. We have time for one more question. Sure. Mark. Yeah. yeah. Listen. Uh, just building on the question that was just asked. Okay. Do you have a position? on uh, whether the U.S. government should be pursuing uh, Julian Assange. You know, sure. The, the news is that there's sealed ind indictments and all this. Do you see a parallel to the Pentagon Papers case, or are we in another league? Um, uh, they're just punishing him. That's all. Why should anybody in, why should anybody in the media, and you'd be amazed how many people in the media are, are writing editorials and hostile to him. I'm not surprised at all. I mean, it's quite astonishing. Yeah. All he did was release you know, so much paper that we're inundated. We can't begin to cope with it. And, um, and it's still going on. We're, in fact, we're, I was just talking earlier, we're getting bored by him already because the papers are, believe me, uh, if not journalists, historians forever are going to be dealing with these papers. There's amazing stuff in them and embarrass the government no end. So we're punishing him. Why should we be against somebody who's, who, and excuse me, you know, it's really simple. In the United States, we have something called the First Amendment, Thomas Jefferson, which is really interesting. And you know the way to put it, really? It's their job to keep it secret, and my job to find it out. Mm -hmm. And that's all, in, in the, where I work, even if we find that there's often I will find out stuff, particularly at the New York Times, even at the New Yorker, there's some things we won't write because it doesn't do any particular good. There's some secret that maybe there are some ways we might collect information about uh, about bad people that we don't want to. Why give it away? I, I have no problem with that. I'm not, I'm not a purist, but in principle, it, it's their job to keep it secret. Assange beat him. He beat him big. And so, of course, they're punishing him. And I think, I think they would do horrible things if they've got him here. And I think he's right. And um, um, uh, I wouldn't want to be, we're, we're, is it Ecuador? No, it's not Ecuador, uh, Correo. Yeah. Yeah. No, Ecuador. Ecuador. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, if I were that president, I'd be careful about how I travel too. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, it's their job to keep it secret and it's our job to get it out. We're gonna end our talk with Mr. Seymour Hirsch. Thank you so much for being here.